When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Spiritual comforts in a time of social distancing. This is a sign of the times, the face mask. The phrase for our times, social distancing. A new widespread cultural experience. Social distance has meant being locked down, being constricted in our activities and our relations. When we do go out, we're encouraged to wear masks and to keep a six foot distance. We are all engaged in some form of social distancing and will be for some time. The stores in Ohio have opened this past week and we can now just for this weekend now go outdoor to restaurants, but we still are a far cry from normal. Social distancing has produced great social changes from the closing of classrooms to the opening of virtual meetings. There is a terrible separation from people in hospitals and nursing homes, and people are dying without the presence of their loved ones. And this is just wrong. We all need relationships, and we all hate being isolated and alone. And we're seeing negative reactions to the social distancing. People gathering without masks down in Cincinnati on Vine Street, or gathering on the beaches in the West Coast and the East Coast. We need help in our difficult experience of social distancing, and I believe that help is, provi is provided for us by Jesus and by the scriptures. I read a text from John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, this is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Jesus is making this promise on the night before he is to be crucified. He's in this, what we call, speaking in the upper room discourse, John 13 through 17. And he tells the disciples that he's about to leave them. Now, they aren't sure what this means, but they know there is the danger of death. And they're uncomfortable, upset, in pain, and anxious. And to comfort them in the midst of their anticipated experience of social distancing from Jesus... He unveils the promise of the Holy Spirit. And what is important for us to note is that while the disciples were to experience the loss of the physical presence of Jesus, they were not going to lose the spiritual presence of Jesus. When he says, or when we say, oh, I'm with you in spirit, it's a metaphor. We just mean I'm for you. When Jesus says it, it's more than a metaphor. It's an intangible reality made real by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, in our experiencing of social distancing today, 
The same comfort of the Holy Spirit for those anxious disciples is available now for you and I. Jesus says, I'm going to ask the Father to send you another comforter. And he promises five things about this other comforter. Number one, he'll be with them forever. Number two, he will be the spirit of truth. Number three, the world cannot receive this spirit, but you can. Number four, he will bring Jesus' presence and the spiritual community of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it requires obedience. Now, let's take these promises apart briefly. Jesus says he's going to ask for another comforter. Both words are significant. Another picks up on the idea that Jesus clearly understands his comforting presence with the disciples. He's been with them. He was approachable, acceptable, and personal. Now Jesus is asking for someone else just like himself because he's actually going to return into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus is, it's almost as if Jesus is asking for another comforter, another person, and another presence. And he is. Jesus himself is a comfort, and now he's going to ask for another comforter. Now, the word for comfort is a rich word. It's the Greek word paraclete, not parakeet, not the bird, but paraclete. It's a person who comes alongside you for guidance and direction. Now, we have all kinds of words, actually, for a paraclete in our vocabulary today. We don't use the word paraclete, but the function is there and very important for life. In the area of sports, a paraclete is a coach who comes alongside an athlete. In the area of mental or emotional health, the paraclete, the function of the come alongsider, is the counselor. In legal matters, it's the lawyer. In the classroom, it's a teacher. On a trip, it's a tour guide. In business, a paraclete is called a mentor. And in the church, the one who comes alongside, of course, is the pastor. All these fulfill the function of a paraclete. And in all these areas, these coaches, these guidance counselors bring tremendous benefits. But if we're not careful, as we think about these coaches and teachers and mentors, we can miss something that's extremely important. It's not merely that the coach helps the athlete to do well by instruction. It's by personal interest and presence. In the classroom, it's just not the information that the teacher passes on and the student writes down into the notebook. It's the personal care and presence that does something intangible but very real. In a sense, that's why there's a limit to virtual classrooms and meetings that we're experiencing now. We find them beneficial, but we need more than just to see each other in a screen. We need to be with each other. There's almost a personal good infection that comes in the context of relationships between the one who's being guided, between the paraclete and the one who's receiving the guidance. One of the wonderful things about Jesus at his birth uh, the angel prophesied that Jesus would be God Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is not merely giving us his law, his instructions, or prophecy about the future. In Jesus, God has come to be with us. Now, the disciples, enjoying the wonderful presence of Jesus, what it must have been like as God Emmanuel, are facing grief and thinking that he is going to be distanced from them, that he's going away. And Jesus says, don't worry, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You know, in this hunger that we have for relationship, it's interesting that pet adoptions are at an all-time high. Animal shelters are being emptied because people are feeling the need for a companionship, the companionship of a pet. And pets certainly are a good start, but not enough for most of us. It is by means of the Holy Spirit that there can be a continuing divine presence of Jesus with us. Now, here is an interesting twist. Jesus says, I'm going away for you, but don't worry. It's going to be good for you that I go away. Because if I go away, I'm sending this promised Holy Spirit to be with you and in you forever. In a strange sort of way, the experience of social distancing can be a benefit to you and I now. We are so engaged with other people that we can miss the abiding, comforting presence 
that every Christian has of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, there are several pathways or spiritual disciplines over the years that people have found as a way of enriching their experience of the Christian faith. Two of those pathways or spiritual disciplines are silence and solitude. Considering solitude, there's a big difference, difference between being forced into isolation, which leads to loneliness, or choosing to distance yourself from others on purpose. One leads to an empty room. The other, even if you're the only one in the room, leads to a full room. There is more than one person even in the room, if you can, even if you can only see one body. And considering silence, we stop the noise so that we can listen to the Holy Spirit, the quiet voice of the Spirit. There's such thing as an empty silence, and there's such a thing as a full silence. And I put these two practices together, silence and solitude, into the practice of a quiet time. Now, some people think of a quiet time as, uh, as, as devotions. It's not having my devotions into my devotions. I do essentially two things. I pray and I read the Bible. And I like to say that a quiet time is a bit more than that. Quiet time is creating a space and a place in our lives where we can choose to be alone with God. And in this space, in this quiet time, it's a good thing if we read the Bible and if we pray. But our quiet time must not be reduced merely to Bible reading and prayer. There is a bigger spiritual space and reality in which we can indwell and sense that God is with us. And so when we have a quiet time, we become quiet so that we can enjoy the voice, the loving voice, the quiet voice of God in the depths of our hearts. So uh, in this time of lockdown and social distancing, you don't have to feel trapped and isolated. You don't have to be frantic to do something. You can have a refreshing and enriching quiet time. So don't keep the TV on all the time. Spend some time in quiet. And don't hop on the computer right away. Go to FaceTime. Be quiet. Don't look for someone to text or call next. Be quiet. And in the midst of the quiet, we can be content and not empty. We can be satisfied and not bored. We can practice Sabbath. And the word Sabbath means to cease or to stop. But when we ceased and cease and stop, interesting enough spiritually, we begin to dwell, to abide, and to enjoy God. Your home can become a sanctuary, a place set aside in which you create a spiritual space to discern and enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in that quiet space, you can recognize that God is with you. And you can savor that God is with you. And you can enjoy that God is with you. And you can be refreshed as you are alone in the presence of the living God. Now, this other counselor promises, is promised by Jesus to be with you forever. And that means that it's not temporary. He's not going away, an abiding presence. And that should bring a sense of comfort to our lives when we realize this abiding and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Think of yourself on a way to some destination and you have your map and somehow or other Google doesn't give you the right directions and you are lost. And you're around, wandering around in the backwoods in a place you never expected to be. And after driving around for a while and feeling almost a little desperate, you see somebody walking along the side of the road and you pull over to speak to them and you ask for guidance and direction. And the person says, well, you know, you go down and you pass two, ro two dirt roads on the left and then you turn to the right and you go down a hill and then you actually drive over or through a little stream, but that's okay. Then you go up on the other side and you turn right and then you'll be there. Well, this sounds rather complicated, so you ask the person again, and you're trying to scribble down the directions, and you're feeling kind of anxious because you're not sure you're going to be able to find your way out. And the person says, well, hey, why don't you open the door and let me in, and I'll ride with you and guide you till you get there. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's the person who opens the door and gets into the car. This is the best type of guidance, personal presence. You have the comfort of knowing that someone who knows where to go will be with you. This is what Jesus is promising with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says this, this spirit who's with us forever is to be the spirit of truth. And what that means is that 
He can be trusted. He won't say anything that is false or mistaken or misleading. Now, how do you know if you pull over to the side of the road that the person who's asked to get into your car can be trusted? Maybe they're seeking to hurt you. Maybe they'll steal the car and knock you over the head. Jesus says, you don't have to worry about it with the Holy Spirit. You trust me, you can trust him. He is the spirit of truth. And then Jesus goes on to say, this spirit of truth, the world, the culture at large, can't receive. But as a special gift of being my disciple, you can. Now, God's Holy Spirit is everywhere in the world, but he is not personally present inside of everyone in the world. That is the privilege that Jesus uniquely offers to those who believe in him, to love him, and to obey him. He is the spirit of truth. Jesus says the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. This indwelling Holy Spirit is the great gift of Jesus. We can have an internal experience of God from the inside out. And that's why historically Christianity has been known as the religion, not of the book, not merely of the book, but the religion of the heart. This leads us to the next phrase of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, on that day when the Holy Spirit indwells you, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The Holy Spirit brings us into the experience of spiritual community, of communion with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why we say, if someone is considering becoming a believer, perhaps for the first time in their lives, what you need to do is invite Jesus into your heart. And of course, we don't mean that Jesus physically takes up a presence inside of a person, but we mean that by the Holy Spirit, that person, Jesus, by means of the mystery of the triune God, can dwell in the inside of us. And when we receive the Spirit, we dwell in God, and God dwells in us. It's a spiritual mystery that we cannot understand, but nevertheless, we can know and experience. So, in this time of social distancing, when you may not like being alone and distanced from others and it's uncomfortable, this can actually be an opportunity for spiritual growth to learn about, to savor, and to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in fresh new ways. First, remind, you that the, remind yourself there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. A lot of us tend to forget that the Spirit even exists as Christians. And rather than feeling alone, Open up your heart to the Spirit's presence within you. Invite the Holy Spirit to illumine your mind and to fill your heart. Enjoy the intimate communion the Spirit provides with Jesus and his Father. Savor Jesus' words, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So, Jesus says, ironically, although there's grief involved, I'm going away, but it's going to be good for you. In the midst of this social distancing and this uncomfortable time, it can lead to spiritual intimacy because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Like a